Hello, Susan. Hi, Frank. Thanks for um, making some time to um, to have this chat with me. As um, as I was explaining just before, um, it's a way to try to think together, even if we're not in the same room, on how we um, how we go through this, and I mean more than that, right? How do we build on, on the horror that is happening, and um, how do we make sure this actually changes everything in terms of the way people think of Israel, uh, of its supporters, of its backers. Um, I'm sorry to start with this, but I'm, I, I have to. Uh, the numbers are horrifying. Um, right now, we are there's more than 29,000 Palestinian dead, 50,000 at least injuries. More than 100 journalists have been killed. More than 1.9 million people have been displaced. 65,000, more than 65,000 homes have been completely destroyed. Uh, 170,000 have been partially destroyed. Um, press headquarters uh, partially damaged or destroyed 165. 305 schools have been partially damaged or destroyed. 1,500 industrial facilities, 183 mosques, three churches. We can go on and on and on. Um, and even though this is horrifying, these are just numbers, right? They don't reflect the true nature of what's happening. And, and for me, I think through your work, um, uh, through, you know, through social media, through your books, you've been one of the best, best person at um, reframing the way we see Palestine and rehumanizing the way we see Palestinians. Uh, so when I, when I give you these numbers, um, what do they say to you? What do they mean to you in a way? Honestly, I, I, I feel very emotional hearing that. It just even the numbers, um, <clears throat> Because it's, you know, uh, we, because every day, you know, I scroll through the videos and the images and, um, and I know the, the profound despair that underpins all of that. And I also, um, I, I imagine this sort of industrialized terrorism, uh, is still ongoing with no end in sight. And coupled with this feeling of impotence and an inability to make it stop, uh, you know, it's, it's, I want to say devastating, but again, I just don't feel like I have a right to any of those words right now because, uh, because of what people are actually living through. It's not just, I mean, and I think, you know, those numbers are also uh, grossly under, uh, grossly underestimated, um, grossly underestimating the, uh, the, the true harm that has been done. We know that there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who remain trapped under the rubble. Um, and when you think of that, I mean, you know, we know there are people who died or are dying alone in the dark, in the cold. Um, nobody's able to get to them. Nobody knows they're there. Uh, and when you imagine the people, the way that people have died so far, you know, it's not just killing people. It's like just death in the most gruesome, in the most gruesome ways you know, people literally being buried alive. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, I think there's probably no uh, more horrifying way to die than to be buried alive, uh, to be crushed under the weight of walls and ceilings that once contained your memories and your family and, um, and your life. 
and then you know at some point this will end it must but the th but the, the extraordinary destruction puts a big question mark on the future where do people return to what do they return what do they do in the meantime um, I think these are all things that we have to start thinking about and preparing for um, to ensure that Israel is not successful in its aims, which, you know, its true aims are not what they declare. Um, <laughs> or actually, they have declared their true aims. <laughs> so um, it is what they it is what they say, but at least not what they say officially. Um, but we know this is not about Hamas. It's certainly not about the hostages. Um, this is about uh, colonial conquest, as it has always been. I mean, that's the essence of the Zionist project. It is a colonial, European, racist, supremacist movement um, initiated to uh, violently colonize Palestine and steal everything. From the indigenous population and they have been doing that for decades but they have often lamented how inefficient they have been in this colonization um for several reasons number one the, uh, the the Palestinians who remained that they could not get rid of are um, continued to live and and reproduce and Israel has not been able to kill them off quickly enough or contain them or expel them. You know, uh, all along they they talked about creating conditions uh, that would in I think Perez said it conditions that would invite the voluntary migration of Palestinians. So I think that's what they hoped all along, that they could make their Palestinian lives so miserable and desperate that people would just leave of their own accord. And, you know, like like all colonizers and all racists, they, they of course, underestimate the humanity and the uh, attachment of indigenous people to their homes and their lands. And... With that, uh, they have often viewed Palestinian uh, lives as demographic threats. You know, they have been for the past uh, 20 years or so um, speaking openly about how worrisome it is uh, that, you know, between the river and the sea, the number of Palestinians versus uh, Israeli Jews um, could could become equal or or worse even outnumber them so um they have been for years uh planning <laughs> planning genocidal actions like what we're seeing and um and they found an opportunity now to uh to execute that and it is um so you know we were talking earlier i mean it's not we're not surprised um that it has reached this level, but it is shocking. It shocks the conscience. It shocks the mind. It beggars belief. Um, but it is not surprising because every with every massacre that Israel has committed with impunity, the next one was escalated. Every time, it's like they just keep pushing the envelope to see how much they can get away with. And you know when you when when you're able to act with such uh, a brutality and industrialized terrorism for so long without any real consequences, of course you think you can get away with you know with genocide with outright genocide, and that's what they're doing. And you know this impunity has allowed Israelis to think that. The things they're saying are normal. It is a truly pathological society. It really is because what has allowed to proliferate in in the public sphere is so racist, 
so uh, appalling and, uh, and, and really grotesque to most of us in the world. Um, but it, but it, but it's become normalized. So there is there. So I think for most Israelis, there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, yeah, we should kill all the babies. The babies aren't innocent or yeah, we need to turn it into a parking, turn Gaza into a parking lot. And yes, we need to wipe, wipe everybody out and we need to starve them to death. I mean, these are all things that they have been saying. We need to starve them. We need to make sure that there are conditions that would spread disease that would make our job easier. I mean, these are all things in the public sphere, even countries, you know, that want to do things like that, maybe. Um, uh, no better than to say this out loud. Um, but Israelis do say it out loud and they say it a lot because it's normal in that society. And I think, um, I think when this is over and when I say over, I mean, when Israel is over because, because this kind of, uh, uh, profoundly racist regime cannot, cannot continue to thrive in the world. Um, and when this is over, I think we will spend generations unpacking this um, this pathology that was uh, that was allowed to uh, uh, was allowed to continue and and which was nurtured by so called Western democracies that love to preach to the rest of us about you know human rights and and democracy and whatnot. Thanks, Susan. So, so do you, do you think actually? that this is like the beginning of the end for Israel? Do you think Israel, do you think Israel is going to sort of, in a way, self-destruct like a, like a monster that has no sense anymore and that goes into a rampage um, and, and then finally, I think so. yeah. I think, I think they've been on a path toward the end. Um, I mean, it's, you know, Norman Finkelstein calls it a lunatic society, and and it really is. Um, there are no moral restraints uh, that are apparent to the rest of us. There are no, um, no limits, and it's it's truly extraordinary in that, in the face of like this just incredible like unfathomable brutality that we are seeing on our screens that there are people in the world who can look at that and say we want more we need to do more and you know i think about this a lot trying to understand like what you know, like I, I personally, uh, I, I have only rage and hatred towards Zionists. But even in my darkest hour, I could never, there is nothing in me that could ever celebrate something like that if it happened to them. Um, and so I, I think, so it's hard for me to comprehend. Uh, it is hard for me to comprehend who these people are or what they're made of. Um, yeah, I mean, it, to be so utterly devoid of a conscience, not even, not as an individual, but as a collective, to, to go on social media and mock the pain of mothers whose babies have been murdered, um, to mock the pain of people to mock the hunger, to mock the thirst, uh, you know, that is, it's just really not something that I am able to comprehend. And I don't think most, you know, normal people, <laughs> uh, the majority of humanity cannot comprehend it, which is why I think, I mean, this is part of Israel's self-destruction, is it's not so much that they're destructing from within, although there is an element of that, but it is the exposure of who they really are. And that is one thing that is happening now. Gaza has truly, um, uh, uh, it, it has just opened the curtains for on a lot of things. Sorry. 
<laughs> he has to turn around. And so I only get this much of a seat. <laughs> um, Gaza has, it, you know, it has, it has just blown the cover off and there's no, there's no hiding uh, behind this, th these lofty ideals that they've been peddling to the world uh, for decades about democracy and, you know, whatever else, whatever lunacy they, they peddle. And it has also, um, it is, it has also blown the cover off of this sort of mighty Israeli military, right? And it's actually exposed their, their incredible weakness and their cowardice. Um, you know, Israel thinks that they are, are showing strength by uh, mass murdering uh, uh, civilians in the tens of thousands. But in fact, I mean, that is, is uh, proof of their weakness. I mean, that is evidence of, uh, uh, of just a moral vacuum uh, and, and a just a material weakness. I mean, they, they're, they're getting pummeled in battle yeah. by a far weaker guerrilla force that has really nothing but homemade rockets yeah. uh, and, and light armament and, and they're decimating them in battle. So in, 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 in something that resembles a fair fighter, though, it's, it's still not that they are no match for, for Palestinians. They're no match for Hamas. They were no match for Hezbollah. Um, and so they take out this, you know, their humiliation on children, on women, on fathers and grandfathers, and on 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 churches and mosques and universities. I mean, they are um, destroying every every bit of infrastructure that supports life, and that's the aim, right? Is to I mean, that's part of the genocide. I, I want you to yeah go come back to this point about. Uh, I spoke to William Shabas, who is one of the foremost legal experts on the question of genocide, um, maybe a few weeks ago now. And uh, he's, been, uh, he's been studying conflicts and armed conflict for like decades. And he, he made a very important point that you just made as well. He said, you know, look at the number, the number of uh, dead soldiers, in Israeli dead soldiers, like what, just over 100 or something. And he said, for me, it means that they're not engaging in close combat. They are not. Because if they were, you know, you studied wars and stuff and, and conflict, uh, there'll be a lot higher number. So they are not engaging. They, they are bragging about, yeah, we're killing Hamas, you know, combatants and stuff. But it, it's, it's bullshit. They're not. They, they're scared. And that's why I, I think it's part of the, they are so scared that they are shooting at everything. You know, you know, like you, like you put a gun in some, in the hand of someone that is really scared. It just every noise that, you know, mm -hmm. you just shoot at it. But I want to, I wanted to go back to, to a very important moment that is October 7. Because it's been seen by, I'm going to say a part of the world, let's say the West, Western world um, as something. And it's been seen by another part of the world. And I think the majority world as something else. And what Israel has been very good at, uh, at doing uh, is turning like October 7th into this massacre of like bloodthirsty criminals, you know, beheading babies and, and, and shit. When in fact, we all know it's something else and it was something else. So, so for you, what was October 7th? And by the way, I, I know I don't have to say this, but as a human being, I don't like civilians and, and kids to, to be killed. That's like a given. But still, October 7th, what was October 7th for you? Well, first of all, um, I want to just address some, uh, the, the, the number of Israeli soldiers killed um, because it, that's we know from Hamas, which has been completely truthful so far, un, uh, unlike Israel. Um, that that number is far greater, and we also know from uh, um, 
from HRETs and other investigative pieces, that that number is way, way higher. It is more like, I think, 1,600 um, killed and like 5,000 or 6,000 injured. Um, so that's that's one thing. For October 7th, frankly, we still don't know truly what happened. Um, and Israel has rejected uh, uh, UN efforts to uh, to investigate, um, in particular, uh, investigations of the rape allegations. Um, and you know, one has to wonder, like, why? <laughs> um, why are you Why are you afraid of an investigation? Um, actually, can I just jump on the, it's, it? That's very interesting, actually, because these. What's important to remember is that this uh, Israeli organization led by women and one lawyer, I think, said during the attack, women were systematically raped. So it means it's not like just one rape. Every time a fighter came upon a woman, he raped her. But then there's a UN investigation and led by Navi Pillai, a great uh, South African uh, judge that has been working on many issues. And... They pretty much asked this organization in Israel, you're making very serious allegations um, and we're going to investigate them. Can we see the proof? Because that's mm -hmm. the way an, invest an investigation works. And this Israeli lawyer went like, oh, well, you need to see proofs now. So you don't, you know, you don't believe us. So you, yeah, you NTC might like everybody else. You know, it's, it's madness. It's yeah. crazy, you know. But anyway, sorry, go. But they managed to enlist uh, Zionist colleagues at the New York Times who who investigated um, and and said, oh, yes, there was rape. And it's and it's really so let, let me get back to that in a second. But I want to address the full your previous question about October 7th, uh, because we we truly still do not know yet what happened. Israel initially said um, Hamas came and uh, uh, they slaughtered 2000 people. That number was downgraded to 1,400. And then it was downgraded again to 1,200. And then it was downgraded again to 1,139. And they, uh, and then we find out that uh, Israeli Apache helicopters were firing indiscriminately on a lot of the festival goers. Um, likely killing hundreds. So hundreds of those 1139 were killed by Israelis. And then we find out also through another uh, Haaretz investigation that tanks that arrived in the area were firing shells into the homes uh, on that kibbutz, killing untold numbers as well. So we have Apache helicopters killing, tanks killing, and then we also know from testimonies from the survivors of uh, Kibbutz Be'eri that Israeli soldiers who came started firing and 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 killed at least several uh, um, several residents of of the of the Kibbutz colonies. So it's clear <laughs> that. A large portion of that 1139 were killed by Israelis themselves. We don't know how many because they they refused to conduct investigations and they refused to allow independent investigations. So, um, of course, they came out with all kinds of uh, stories that you know just didn't were not supported by evidence. Were actually contradicted by the evidence, including you know the 40 beheaded babies that they supposedly saw but yet there's no record there's no images and then finally they said oh no they don't exist uh so that was the 40 beheaded babies and then there was like the the babies that were hung on clothesline i mean all kinds of really truly sensational things um and then and then after like you know two months comes this rape allegation uh a uh, systematic rape allegation and because no, none of the other things are sticking. Let's try this, you know, let's try this one. Um, and, and again, there's, there's no, there, there's, there's no evidence that's offered, as you said. Now, now comes the, the, the New York Times investigation um, that was published yesterday, I think, or the day before. And they're saying, it, and it's, the evidence is based on one woman's testimony 
who said that she witnessed five women, she was hiding somewhere, five women uh, being brought to that area, to, to an area that she could see. Um, and then they were systematically raped. They were mutilated in front of her eyes, etc. And apparently there was a guy next to her who was hiding in the same place. And he said he didn't look, he didn't see anything because he just didn't want to look up. But then he looked up once and saw one woman. I mean, the, oh, it, it is, it, you know, if that happened in that area, there should be, there should be forensic evidence. If somebody, if people are being mutilated, the ground has blood on it. You know, it's easy to conduct investigations, but apparently none of that was was done. And also, like, what 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 did Hamas have a designated rape area where they brought women, all these women, to this one place where where she could see that? You know what I mean? It's a lot of it is preposterous. But what what's also, um, and I and I'm not saying that they didn't happen. I just don't know. Like, we don't know. There's no real investigation happening to see if that's true. And if it's true, then then people should be held to account because you know, as a woman you know, rape is never, can never be a, 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 a weapon of war. Um, but given Israel's track record of just outright lying and gaslighting the whole world, I don't believe a word that comes out of their mouths, frankly. And I also, we know from, uh, from what we know about Hamas, right? We don't have these racist views that that Western people have been brainwashed into believing about Muslims and Arabs and Palestinians in particular. The, the, the kind of piety that they possess would never allow that. Even if a Hamas fighter wanted to do that, I cannot imagine any situation in which other fighters would go along with it. They would not be allowed to be members of Hamas. I mean, now, the other piece of evidence is that, you know, they've had a lot of women in their custody for a very long time. They could do with them whatever they want. And yet every single female hostage who was released uh, has refuted anything of the sort. There was a recent um, interview with this uh, uh, a woman and her daughter um, in which you know she described a, a moment when when they decided to arm wrestle uh, the, the the mother and the, uh, one of the Hamas fighters, and he used a towel to arm wrestle her because it is forbidden for a Muslim man to touch a woman who uh, is not you know an immediate relative. So if if a Hamas, you're going to tell me that these people who will not touch the the who who have to have a towel between him and, and, and another woman to arm wrestle her in, in fun, that these people were rape, systematically raping women. Like it doesn't compute with what, what we know about Hamas. Um, so again, we don't know what happened on October 7th, but regardless, what we do know historically is that Rebellions of the oppressed are sometimes brutal. Slave rebellions were brutal. Indigenous American rebellions were brutal. They included killing of innocents. But that does not blind us to who the victims truly were. There is a context. And Israel wants to strip context away from anything, from, from, from narratives. They want us to believe, they want the world to believe that um, Palestinians are just these bloodthirsty, Jew hating, irrational, violent, stupid, dark people who, who kill for the fun of it. Um, and that's the narrative, and it's, and people aren't buying it anymore. Thankfully, there's a new generation that, that understands Israel is nothing more than, uh, than a bloodlust colony in the heart of the Arab world. Um, but you know, the, the price 
the price that Palestinians are forced to pay over and over and over for the rest of the world to just see us as human beings, as an indigenous people who have suffered unspeakably for decades under this uh, uh, European violent settler colony that has been imposed on us ostensibly to to assuage the 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 guilt and feelings and uh, whatnot of of white Europeans who turned against their own uh, uh, European Jewish population. So um, you know the, the price is uh, uh, that is that is exacted from Palestinians is extraordinary. Um, but I still believe that we will be victorious at the end of this. Um, one way or another, and I hope it's in my lifetime, uh, because there's nothing more that I want and, and that most Palestinians want is uh, more than to just go home, to just go home and and be where all of our stories began and return, um, to be where all of our ancestors are buried, to be where everything we are uh, was was created and forged over millennia, um, and and that's it. Thanks, Ida. I want you to to end with this. Actually, I'm not going to end with what you just said. I want I want to end with the last question because you you said that um, a lot of people not, are not buying it anymore. You know this Israeli exceptionalism, uh, this whatever David versus Goliath. Um, and, and I feel this moment, you know, I, uh, the, the first major war on Gaza I experienced was, um, operation cast led as they, as they called it in 2008, 2009, I had friends on the ground, um, Vittorio Arigoni, yeah. Eva Yashevich, Alberto Arce, hey. Qu Quiva, Butley, um, Eva Bartlett, you know, lots of friends that volunteered with uh, the Red Cross and made a film actually that unfortunately like is not available anymore called To Shoot an Elephant, which was amazing, a film by uh, Alberto Arce and uh, Mohamed Rujaila. And I remember after Operation Cast Lead, talking to activists and lawyers and stuff, we felt like this moment is going to change everything. This, they, they went too far. And it didn't, you know, and I mean, in insight, I think it started changing everything you know it's like drop by drop but it didn't change things as much as we wanted it to change and i mean you, there's so many moments the, the mavi mamara you know israeli you know commandos shooting and killing nine civilians on a turkish boat including actually a turkish american civilian nothing much happened but this moment i just and i was talking with nura about it i just feel it in the air, I just feel it when I talk to people. I just feel it with people contacting me, people that never wanted to speak about Palestine before that have uh, contacted me saying, Frank, there's something wrong in the in the media, the way you know Israel Palestine is portrayed. So my last question was like was like is uh, sorry, how do we make sure this moment change everything? How do we finally Palestinians and the supporters go on the offensive, because we, we've we been on the defensive. And in a way, we've been a reactionary movement, if you know what I mean, right? We, we're getting attacked, we defend ourselves. We're getting attacked, we defend ourselves. We've got all the tools to actually be on the offensive. Every, we've got the moral high ground, we've got international law, we've got justice, we've got everything, you know. So how do we make sure this changes everything? How do we make sure Israel, its supporters, its backers are turned into pariahs, in a way? Yeah. And that's my last question. No, and it's a, it's a, it's an important question, and it's something we all need to be contemplating. And I don't think there's just a single way. But you kind of, you you kind of answered your own question. It's how do we go on the offensive, and that's that's where we start from at this point. It is it it and and actually, Hamas has allowed us to think this way. It has, in a way, it is freeing our minds. Um, and it is helping us imagine victory. They are helping us, you know, uh, uh, realize that Israel is just this 
morally bankrupt paper tiger. All they can do is just drop bombs and just kill indiscrim indiscriminately. And that is a profound weakness. It is a, it is a, it, you know, um, so, so we, you know, starting from, from this point, from a point of offense, and then I think in every facet, um, we have to, we have to utilize an offensive posture. Um, there should be now dozens, if not hundreds of lawsuits um, filed uh, uh, from every country. I mean, there is so much evidence of war crimes. There's so much evidence of genocide and expert opinions on this. There's, you know, there's evidence of uh, uh, all kinds of, you know, unconstitutional behavior in this country. Um, so, so there's a legal front. There's also the um, the awareness front and uh, PR campaigns, if you will, to to raise awareness about um, to continue to raise awareness rather of of what Israel has been doing to Palestinians. I think too, you know, the, the complicity of U.S. media and U.S. tech giants as well um, is something that that should be challenged uh, at every level as well um, through civil society as well as legal legal the legal communities. Um, even though Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter are private corporations, they are they are not above laws and regulations and there are um there there are a lot of legal avenues where they can they can be held accountable for the systematic propaganda and silencing of Palestinian voices and Palestinian content and they should be and I think this is this is a place where people have to start I think we have to start going after all the all of these Zionist organizations who have been funding Israel and funding this genocide and supporting it they they should be held account in the in courts as well um, of course all of this takes money and um uh but you know, I, it's it's not beyond our reach uh, to, to do this, and I think um, I think this needs to happen. I think civil society as well. I don't think we should let up on the protests. I don't think we should let up on um, on everything we're doing on on disrupting the status quo on uh, on blocking ships on you know, on protesting and and sabotaging weapons manufacturers, uh, on withdrawing our uh, our money from from uh, banks and investment companies that uh, that are tied to Israel. You know, we and and this is not we're not in we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There there is precedent for for this kind of um, international mass mobilization. Um, the difference with this instance, however, is that Israel is has spent at this point billions of dollars in brainwashing at least West, the Western people. Um, so, uh, you know, it, and there's also this sort of, um, pop, in popular imagination, uh, Israel equals Judaism, equals Jewish people, equals victims, equals eternal victims, equals centuries of, of, uh, of oppression. So, you know, this Israel has been really successful at conflating all of these things in popular imagination. And I think our task is to is to unravel that and and show it for the lie that it is and for the and this is also a task, I think, for Jewish uh, uh, for Jewish Americans and Jewish Westerners, um, European Jews as well. So uh, because just as just as Israel is colonizing Palestine, it's also colonizing Judaism, you know, um, which is astounding. It's really, it's, 
but anyway, that's that's a whole nother um it's a whole nother conversation. Um Shukran Nikir, Susan. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad you're doing this, Frank. And um and yeah. 